So Tibet is this huge region. Uh, it is mostly empty. And Mao Zedong decided to invade Tibet in, I think, 1950. Yeah, early 1950s invaded. And the Chinese were doing very badly in the invasion of Tibet. It's such a vast territory. The supply lines, logistical lines were overstretched. The Chinese were starving. They did not have food. So what happens? Mr. Nehru supplies them with rice. During the war? During the invasion of Tibet. Okay, the attempted the Chinese invasion of Tibet. Mr. Nehru sent rice to the Chinese soldiers. That is why they were able to conquer Tibet. You can look it up. I'm not inventing this story. It's Chini, all the bye-bye. Yeah. When the British left, if they left behind a unified subcontinent, and if India gave access to Russia to the Indian Ocean, it was game over for the West. Then India will become on the on the, on the side of the USSR, and there will be a huge coalition and a very powerful coalition, with, and it will give Russia, for the first time in its history, access to the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. So they wanted to anyhow prevent this from happening. A unified India would not listen to Britain. So the British created a fake artificial nation, divided on the lines of religion, a small nation that will always feel threatened by India if you teach them the right, right things, and they will always be pro-West, pro-British, and that's why they, this country, this fake artificial nation, temporary nation was created. And if you look at Pakistan's history, it's always been pro-UK, pro-West. And the UK has always been pro-Pakistan, even today it is pro-Pakistan, even today the US is pro-Pakistan. This is the geopolitical reason why Pakistan was created. All this, what we are taught, this freedom struggle and the do Kaubi Nazariya, two nation, three theory, this is all, you know, it's all cosmetic paint that has been applied to the real reasons why Pakistan was created. So Russia, see every nation looks out for its own national interest. Every nation prioritizes its national interest over everything else. These are the principles of Vishnu Gupta Chanakya and we have to understand that. We are from the land of Vishnu Gupta Chanakya but we are so delusional and we are so naive. We think Russia is our best friend. There are no friends in geopolitics. There are temporary enemies and there are temporary allies but everything is temporary. Please read the Arthashastra. Read what our great Guru Shri Vishnu Gupta Chanakya told us. The most naive population I see in the world today is Indians. That too coming from the land of Vishnu Gupta Tanakya. Israel is not our friend. Israel is cooperating with India because it suits them. They gained, they, they, they stand to gain much. Welcome all to Anvik Shiki YouTube channel. This is our first video. And with us was Abhijit Chawda sir. It was a wonderful experience. And we were so fortunate to have him for our inaugural edition. 90 plus people especially youngsters attended this event ye hamara first video tha to please thoda sa hum pe easy jana aur kuch bhi feedback ho usko comment mein zarur likhna and also remember to like share and subscribe ab chalte hai video pe bilkul bhi ummeed nahi thi ki itne sare jan pehle hi edition mein aa jayenge to anvikshi ki vichar manch ye naam anvikshi ki ये मुझे विजन इंडिया फाउंडेशन जो अभी राष्ट्रम नाम से जाना जाता है उसके एक पॉलिसी बूट कैंप में मुझे एक प्रोफेसर मिले थे उनके प्रोफेसर मिले थे तो उनने मुझे ये बताया था कि आन्विक शिकी का मतलब होता है साइंस ऑफ इंक्वायरी या स्पिरिट ऑफ इंक्वायरी या फिर और एक तरीके से बोल सके तो इन्वेस्टिगेटिव स्पिरिट तो यहाँ हम उसी के लिए एकत्रित हुए कि हम कुछ जाने एक हमारी एक क्यूरोसिटी रहे चीज़ों को जानने की और इसी तरीके से हम आगे बढ़ना चाहते हैं तो लेट्स स्टार्ट यहाँ पे हमारे साथ आज है अभिजीत जी ऑफ क्लैन चावड़ा इनके लिए क्या बोलूँ मतलब इतनी सारी चीज़ें द रेंज ऑफ स्पेक्ट्रम इज सो वास्ट ये प्रोफेशनली थियोरिटिकल फिजिसिस्ट है हॉबी वाइज हिस्ट्री में बहुत रुचि है तो इतना बुक्स पढ़ा है इतना सारा स्क्रिप्चर्स पढ़ा है कि ही इज ही कैन बी एक्चुअली कॉल्ड अ हिस्टोरियन एंड और उसी वजह से जियो पॉलिटिक्स में uh, ये एक एक्सपर्ट भी माने जाते हैं सो ऑन टू यू नाउ अभिजीत जी अच्छा बाय द वे ही ऑल्सो हैज़ अ यूट्यूब चैनल बाई द नेम ऑफ अभिजीत चावड़ा वो बताने की ज़रूरत नहीं है बट because it's an introduction and ask abhijit show is where we all see him so on to him so first question for you is what is geopolitics hello yes sir thank you so much for the introduction and uh, nice to meet you all nice to see you all great to be here and uh, thank you for inviting me so geopolitics is sabse pehle main kshama chahunga main english mein bolne wala hu please excuse me mere i'm more comfortable in english uh, so geopolitics is the struggle for world domination, essentially. Geopolitics can be thought of as a sport. Up sport khelte. So geopolitics is the biggest sport in the world, a sport in which the 
objective is to win the entire power and resources of the world and it's a sport in which you make up the rules as you go whoever gets more powerful can make the rules as they want so these days we have the so-called rules based world order which the americans talk about it is actually the whims based world order it is the whims and fancies of the americans but they call it the rules based world order so whoever is dominant decides the rules so that is what geopolitics is it's about resources it's about power and it's about control of the world so because if you see our topic it says history history of russia china and pakistan so how does history and because i have written here geopolitical special but we are talking about history so yeah see uh, in geopolitics we have to understand history geopolitics is about I, i it's about control of power and all that but to understand what's happening you to you to look back in time you cannot see what happened right now and decide what's happening and why is it happening we have to understand the root causes of why certain things are happening right now and to understand the root causes we have to look at a nation's geography and you have to understand the nation's history every nation has a certain character like every individual has a certain personality certain character which is more or less constant from birth to death similarly every nation every culture has a certain personality certain character and every nation if you understand that and if you understand their past if you want to truly understand a person you have to look at their past if you want to marry your daughter or your son to somebody you have to look at the family's past right similarly to understand where a nation is going we have to see where it came from and that's why history is so important it's about causality it's about cause and effect it's about the sequence the, the the chain of cause and effect they teach us history in the sense of memorizing dates and names but they don't teach us the cause and effect sequence if you understand why things happened then you don't have to memorize anything then it becomes fascinating so that's why history is so important to geopolitics i never set out to learn geopolitics i was simply interest, uh, interested in history because history for me i never studied textbooks from school i studied the books from elsewhere because i was fascinated i was curious i i for me it was more interesting than any novel you know so that's how i saw it and then after many years i realized i understand geopolitics because i understand history so that's how it happened fantastic answer so that connects the topic to the special of the day so now we move on to the topic so russia history of russia now as you said the past their behaviors and what has been going on very uh, the popular thing going on with russia right now so what is their history what is their actual core behavior that's what we would like to know right russia is a fascinating country it's a nation with which we have had a lot of uh, a very uh, strong and significant relationship since 1947 especially india russia ties we always speak about that so and russia is very important now nowadays because of what's happening in the ukraine region the re ukraine conflict so we have to understand people would like to know why this is happening and what are the causes and to understand the causes we have to understand the history of russia itself so let's go back in time i typically go back 1000 years this time i'll go back 2000 years so the f so the people of russia the people of there is a certain ethnicity called the slavic people okay the slavic people the russians are the main slavic group it's a group of languages and it's a, it's a certain culture so the russians are slavic people the ukrainians are slavic people the serbians croats bosnians czechoslovakians poles slovenians all these peoples are the slavic peoples they are the same or overall ethnicity and they speak a group of languages which are overall called the slavic languages like we have a bunch of languages in india which everybody can understand more or less similarly slavic languages are also more or less mutually intelligible so the history of the slavic people goes back at least about 2000 years in roman chronicles there is a mention of what seems to be a slavic tribe or ethnicity so it seems to go back about 2000 years then the slavic people uh, they typically lived around uh, northern and eastern europe north east europe uh, i'm talking about the boundary of europe and asia the the imaginary boundary around that place they always have lived about around 900 ad you had something called the the confederation confederation of the rus people so the rus people were a slavic uh, were a group of slavic tribes who happened to be ruled by a group of vikings called the uh, called the kievan rus 
so these vikings were actually scandinavian people they, they were the leadership of the slavic people and they were called the rus that's why this slavic group came to be known as the rus their capital was kiev they were called the kievan rus their major uh, ruler was uh, his name was grand prince vladimir the ukrainians call him volodymyr the russians call him vladimir he was the grand prince vladimir and he was the rus leader of the kievan rus the capital original capital of the rus people is kiev okay today it's the capital of ukraine but it's the original capital of the rus people then uh, the kievan rus became a very prosperous community they they had these trade networks this is in the 10th 11th 12th century ad about 800 900 years before today they had a big uh, trade network they used to trade with various parts of europe and with the uh, with the byzantine empire all that byzantine empire is in istanbul constantinople that region yeah uh, so the slavs and the rus were doing very well then in the 13th century you had a terrible uh, event which was the mongol invasion the sudden rise of the mongol empire under chinggis khan and chinggis khan's descendants went on to conquer russia and until the late 14th 15th century the rus were ruled by the mongols it was a very tough time for the rus people they call it the mongol yoke they were under the mongol yoke and the mongols instituted lots of uh, reforms and changes in the administrative structure it became more militarized it became more formalized there were some uh, progressive changes also you can say let's not go into that but yeah it was a period of of mongol rule for about about two to three centuries then with the decline of the mongol empire in the late 14th 15th century around that time there was a resurgence in the uh, rule of the slavic people and it all came with uh, ivan the 3rd who uh, defeated the mongols and reestablished sovereignty and independence of the rus uh, nation or republic the capital was now changed to moscow from kiev okay so it now shifted to moscow then ivan the third's grandson who was named ivan the terrible he created a massive empire okay so this was a massive empire this is this is the first time the russians become a major global or geopolitical power they become a major north european power europeans always saw the russians as outsiders as easterners not white but asiatic asiatic people because they they had uh, they had mixed ethnicity by this time with the mongols and all that mixed blood and all that uh, and all that so you have uh, the beginning of the russian empire under ivan the 3rd then ivan the terrible at this time this region in the south of russia adjoining the black sea region the russians gave it the name of the borderlands and the word for borderlands in russian is ukraina ukraina so they called that region as the buffer zone between R the russian empire and the various european nations it was called the borderlands it was a russian region ukraina all right that's where ukraine begins and ukraine is definitely 100% slavic it is definitely a descendant of the kievan rus of 1000 years ago that's ukraine so you have ivan the terrible who established a great and very brutal empire then you have peter the great in the 17th century i think then you had uh, Catherine the Great in the 18th century these people they tried to uh, transform the russian society into something that was more eurocentric more westernized more modern in their opinion because you know russians were kind of primitive and more asian in in character until that time so so that is under, under uh, peter the great who transformed russia into a major maritime nation and then there was the expansion of russia into the east today if you see the map of russia where's the map where's the map Okay, can you please open the map? I'll show the map. Show the map. You okay. So let's take a look at the map because it always helps us to visualize things. Okay, here we are. So today, if we see the map, we see this enormous nation called Russia. It stretches from Europe all the way into the far east of Asia. During the time of Peter the Great, Russia was still very much concentrated around Moscow and it was more or less in the european region then russians started expanding eastwards because of a single reason simple reason the fur trade this entire siberian region and and north Euro north asia region is extremely abundant in all these uh, furry animals like ermines and minks and uh, seals also and all that 
and the fur trade was very lucrative and nobody else in Europe was willing to go into those harsh, cold environments. So the Russians started expanding way eastwards and eventually by the late 19th century they had conquered all of northern Eurasia and they had even taken over Alaska. So Alaska was a Russian possession until the mid 19th century. Okay, So that's how Russia became so big. It was all a process of conquest. Conquest by force. It was not voluntary. There are lots of people who live in this uh, region, the vast region of, of Northern Asia, who are essentially Turkic peoples and Mongolic peoples, Tuvan peoples, Aleutian peoples. They are not Russians. But today their primary language is Russian because of the process of Russification. The Russians imposed their language and culture on these people. That's what happened. So by the late 19th century, by the mid 19th century, by the 1850s, Russia is this enormous expanse of territory. And at that time, in the Crimea region, it was the Cossacks who were mostly uh, living there. The Cossacks, uh, Cossacks were a semi-nomadic tribe who were Russified by the Russians. And this region, once again, was just called Ukraina, the borderlands of Russia. And then what happened is that we had the expansion of the British Empire. We know the British conquered India, and they were also fighting for influence in Central Asia. And this came to a head in the Crimean War in the 1850s, which the British won. And the Russian Empire was then in, in a state of crisis. As a, as a result of that, they had to sell off Alaska to the Americans. So Alaska is now a part of America. The Russians sold it for a very small amount. They thought there is nothing there. Today, there are enormous reserves of, of coal and gas and, and gold in Alaska. The Russians didn't know it. So that is what happened. So uh, then you have, you, then you come to the 20th century. In the 20th century, we had the Russian Revolution, 1817, uh, sorry, 1917, in which the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas, was ousted, and eventually he and his family were executed by the Bolsheviks. Stalin, uh, sorry, uh, at the time it was uh, what is his name? Lenin was it? Yes, Vladimir Lenin, of course. Yeah. So that was the Bolshevik Revolution in which the entire system of the Tsarhood was, was abolished and Russia came under, uh, Russia became the USSR. Russia became the Union of Soviet Socialist uh, Republics and the whole new system was, was established, communism, socialism, uh, whatever you want to call it. Then uh, you had the First World War, the Second World War, the Bolshevik Revolution happened in the middle of the First World War. At the, in the Second World War, the USSR lost at least 70, lost at least 27 million men in the war against the Nazis. It is the USSR that defeated the Nazis. It was not the US. It was the USSR that defeated the Nazis at the expense of oceans, oceans of blood. General Winter. General Winter actually was the punishment for the Nazis. General Winter did not, pun did not defeat the Nazis. He was the punishment for them not taking Moscow. It was the Russians who fought and ground down the, the, the uh, Nazis. And then winter came and ruined everything. Rasputit. Uh, Rasputit, sir. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that is what happened in World War II. At the end of World War II, the world was divided into two systems. One was the democratic liberal system of the West, the US. The US was the winner of the World War II on the Western side. And Russia had won on the Eastern side. Russia was able to come out of the ruins and the disaster of war and establish an enormous industrial base. And in just a short amount of time, it was able to establish itself as a genuine superpower. Incredible achievement that nobody can deny, all right? So that's what happened. Now, Joseph Stalin is in power. And Stalin's rule was very, very, very harsh, very brutal. There were horrible famines. There was in all kinds of repression in Russia. Lots of people were executed. Purges, horrible purges. There was the, the great Holodomor famine in Ukraine at the time. Uh, there was a complete disaster and all that. During Stalin's time, for administrative reasons, this Russian region called Crimea, where is Crimea? Here is Crimea. It is this peninsula in the Black Sea. Yeah. So during Stalin's time, he arbitrarily assigned this region to the Ukraine SSR, just for administrative purposes. This has always been a Russian-speaking and ethnically Russian region. But Stalin, for administrative purposes, made it part of the Ukraine uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, which was like a state of the country. Then we know what happens. The, uh, eventually, Russia loses the Cold War. In the early 1990s, Russia, the USSR breaks up under the leadership of the great Mr. Gorbachev. His uh, policies of perestroika and glasnost accelerated all this. So USSR breaks up. 
Ukraine and various other states in Central Asia, etc., they declared their independence. Crimea remains a part of Ukraine, even though it was never Ukrainian. Yeah. Uh, then there is an, uh, an agreement between the, the Russians and the West that, uh, that uh, essentially is a deal for the denuclearization de of Kazakhstan and Ukraine in exchange for NATO giving a commitment it will not expand west eastwards. So NATO was the, was the American-led alliance in Western Europe and the Russian-led alliance was the Warsaw Pact. So essentially what happened is that the Americans gave an assurance to the Russians that we will not expand NATO eastwards and please allow Ukraine to become independent and take back the nuclear weapons. That was the kind of agreement and immediately in the 1990s as, as soon as this happened the Americans started expanding NATO eastwards. NATO is essentially it is essentially an instrument of the US. NATO is nothing but a proxy of the US. The US has two proxies in Europe. One is NATO, the second is the European Union. In both these coalitions, the US is a true dominating partner. The people think of Europe as, as a nation, as, as a region that is dominated by France and Germany. The truth is that the only genuine power in Western Europe is the United States. And it has been so since the end of the Second World War. Germany is under permanent US occupation since 1945. The German constitution was written by the Americans. It was accepted without protest by the Germans. Italy has been under US occupation, permanent US occupation, military occupation since 1945 until today. So is the case with Japan and South Korea, 1950s, and so on and so forth, right? South Korea also. So, but South Korea and Japan, they both are East, so they, Russia won the East, and still why US gets to control them? Let's come to that. Let's come to that. Let's, let's finish this one. So, uh, what happens is that the Americans broke the promise immediately. Slowly, they started expanding NATO eastwards, and now they reached Ukraine in 2013, 2014. There was this revolution, which was nothing but a US-engineered coup, the so-called Euromaidan revolution in which the democratically elected government of Ukraine was ousted illegally, unconstitutionally, and a US-supported US puppet regime, Mr. Poroshenko, was put in power. Eventually, now it is Mr. Zelensky. So that's the deal. That's why this conflict happened. Now let's go back to, like your question said, about uh, Japan and Korea. So what happened there? Why is that also the case? So if you go to Japan today, there are more than 130 permanent US military bases on Japanese soil. In other words, Japan is not a free nation. Japan is under foreign occupation since 1945. No one realizes this. The Japanese constitution was written in 1945 by American generals. From 1945 until today, not a single word has been changed. This is not a democracy. It pretends to be a democracy. There was only one leader in Japan who had any standing and he is dead. Yeah? Very strange. So yeah, that, that's what happened in Japan. So what happened is, is that in 1945, the Americans tested two nuclear devices on the Japanese civilian population, yes? And as a result, the Japanese government was forced to surrender, otherwise there would be more deaths. The Americans took over Japan, established a whole network of military bases. Russia won the East, so what happened? There are these islands over here called the Kuril Islands, okay? Right next of Hokkaido, the, the great Northern Japanese island is Hokkaido, which is in the screen right now. And just off the north of Hokkaido, you have the Kuril Islands. This one, Kunashir, and, and, and so on and so forth. All of these islands were taken over by Russia. The Russians would have wanted to take over Japan also, but they, the Americans were already there. So they came all the way south up to the Kuril Islands. And this is now a disputed, uh, it's, a, it's a territorial dispute between Russia and Japan. So that's what happened there. The Russians won the Kamchatka Peninsula. They won the Sakhalin Island. They even, uh, if you go back in history, they even took over, uh, took over parts of uh, Manchuria with the Chinese claim. The port of Vladivostok is right next to North Korea. So the Russians have major territorial gains in Eastern Asia. They won this region, but they could not take over Japan. Then you had the Korean War in the 1950s, which was essentially a proxy war between the communist powers and the democratic, so-called democratic powers of the US. China and the USSR wanted to take over the Korean Peninsula. The Americans intervened. Eventually, there was a, sto a stoppage of war. It was not an official ceasefire. And that's how you have the divided Korean, Korean Peninsula between North Korea and South Korea. North Korea is a Chinese puppet now, 
okay it is entirely controlled by china it is beholden to china south korea has i don't know how many maybe dozens maybe more than 100 american military bases permanently stationed on their territory south korea is in the same situation as japan it is under permanent us military occupation that's what happened and sir any um, ancient indian russian history which gives us the naturalized tag to it right so they have discovered uh, idols of indian gods and goddesses in in uh, in the in the depths of russia uh, i don't remember which part of russia it was it was uh, so if you go to uh, if you go to azerbaijan there's a city called baku azerbaijan was part of the ussr in baku there is a fire temple which is used by the hindus as well as zoroastrians of the region historically it was used by them now azerbaijan is very much uh, islamic uh, country or whatever but uh, yeah, in the past, there was a presence there. But north of Azerbaijan, in Russia proper, in some village, I don't remember the, remember the name, they discovered a Vishnu idol, a, a, a murti of, of Lord Vishnu that dates back to in the first millennium AD, like before 1000 AD. Yeah? So there has been a presence of, of, uh, of Dharmic culture in Russia. There have been long ties. Today, there is a massive Buddhist Sangha in Russia, official uh, Buddhist clergy in Russia. Uh, the Buddhist influence in Russia dates back to the Mongol times. Okay. The Mongols themselves uh, practiced Tibetan Buddhism. Tengrism uh, and Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, they both are different. Yeah, they are both different. Okay. Tengrism is a polytheistic uh, belief system. It's very similar to Hinduism. Okay. Yeah, But it, eventually they also, uh, they also took up Buddhism via Tibet because of the Tibetan influence. And then they spread that across Russia. So that's how Buddhism entered Russia. So there's a very okay. uh, rich history there. So I think that's where we come to know a lot about Russian history. Now we move on to China. Mm. Lots of revelations because I have seen your videos. But yeah, so please take over. Right, China is a whole different cup of tea. Uh, so if you so if you think about the history of India, just going by facts, not by stories. According to the hard facts, archaeological evidence. India's civilization dates back at least 10,000 years. The oldest archaeological site in India that has been actually excavated is Birrana in uh, Haryana. It has been carbon dated to about 9.5 thousand years before today. And there are more than 2,000 unexplored archaeological sites along the dry riverbed of the Saraswati. So if you go and explore there, you will find sites, archaeological sites that are way older than Birana. That is guaranteed. So India's culture, India's civilization is unbroken and you will find unmistakable evidence of cultural continuity in all these archaeological sites which means the same culture has been persisting for 10,000 years in different forms but it is the same culture the same core culture so Indian civilization is at least 10,000 years old now the other great civilization today there are two civilization states one is India one is China the other great civilization is China they are about 3,000 years old if you want to be charitable to them they are about three and a half thousand years old <laughs> that's how old China is right uh, and if you look at the founding founding myth of China the, the 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 mythical founder of China is the great yellow emperor dragon emperor he he comes from the west west of China so he was not Chinese he came from west somewhere and he brought culture and civilization and all that order into China so China is about three and a half thousand years old maximum uh, they have undergone a lot of turmoil uh, and they have been under in Indian influence for at least two and a half thousand years. So the great Chinese diplomat and statesman Hu Xi wrote that India for 2000 years completely dominated China without sending a single soldier across the border. What this means is that the Chinese were so enamored with Indian culture once they discovered it that they that they used to send ambassadors and, and embassies to India requesting Indian kings and queens and emperors to send scholars to China to translate Sanskrit sutras into Chinese. And lots of these scholars from India went there. There were even wars between various Chinese kings for, the, for, for, for hosting an Indian scholar. So there was this guy called, uh, what was his name? No, that's later. That's later. I, I forget the name. His, his mother's name was Jeev Sena or something. A very, very uh, famous Indian scholar who was half Kashmiri and half Khotanese. So he was in China. Shwanzang. Not Shwanzang. Okay. Shwanzang was Chinese. Uh, 
yeah so i forget the name okay because uh, but but the chinese went to war for him there were two different chinese kingdoms both wanted to host him so they want, went to war with each other and eventually one of them took this guy hostage and they forced him to marry and have children there uh, very very f- strange stories yeah so uh, so the chinese were deeply deeply impressed with indian culture they were so impressed with indian culture see the chinese what what do they call themselves they call themselves the middle kingdom right china has historically called itself the middle kingdom the middle of the earth the center of the earth the name for india was tianzhu tianzhu means the center of heaven okay the chinese name for india was tianzhu the center of heaven they called themselves the center of earth but india was the center of heaven that is how highly they regarded india and that's how deeply influenced they were by indian culture so many indian pilgrims uh, indian dharma gurus went there uh, for instance there was this uh, this uh, a king whose name i don't forget i don't remember chinese names very easily but he uh, started a, a monastery for an indian uh, guru whose name was uh, whose name was uh, buddha bhadra so buddha bhadra had gone to china for the purpose of translating sanskrit sutras into chinese he spent many years doing that eventually he passed away then the chinese asked for a, uh, requested india to send a different monk a different guru and the indians sent a guy called bodhidharma to this place so this monastery that was established for the sake of Bodh, Bodh, buddha bhadra eventually became bodhidharma's monastery it's now called the shaolin monastery it is where buddha, buddha dharma taught the chinese a yoga based martial art which is now called kung fu so kung fu originates in india right and so much more in chinese culture has originated in india uh, china has always been an imperial system uh, they the people of china have typically practiced buddhism but the emperors and the ruling class they typically practice confucianism or taoism a mixture some kind of balance between confucianism and legalism legalism says that the emperor is the god and whatever he says is the law confucianism is a more soft kind of thing it says that uh, there, there should be emphasis on family values and all that but both are atheistic in nature legalism as well as confucian confucianism confucianism there is no god in confucianism confucius confucius yes confucius confucius is the guy who started that so the rulers of china have always had this atheistic mindset the okay. people of china they uh, even today china has the world's largest, largest buddhist population practicing buddhists but the rulers have always had this uh, more hard nosed mindset so china has had many many dynasties in the past 2 and a half 3000 years uh, some of these dynasties have been conquest dynasties which means it is foreigners who con- conquered china and ruled china in the 8th century the tibetans conquered china and took the capital and installed a puppet gone a puppet uh, emperor in china tibet once conquered china then what happened is tibetans became buddhist and then they became all dharma dharm dharm all what ahimsa and all that stuff yeah so buddhism was kind of uh, yeah it was not very good for tibet overall so china has had many many dynasties one of the great dynasties of recent times was the yuan dynasty which was a conquest dynasty it was the mongols who were ruling china yes so it starts with Ch- uh, sri chinggis khan the great warrior for peace yeah he conquered china it, for for the sake of peace and uh, he established uh, he conquered china twice he took beijing twice chinggis khan uh, his grandson kublai khan became the first mongol emperor of china he established the, the yuan dynasty which is a chinese dynasty of mongol origin and they backdated the first yuan emperor to be chinggis khan but it's actually uh, kublai khan so the yuan dynasty lasted for a while mo- slightly more than a century and during the yuan dynasty's time their soldiers captured la- large parts of asia because the mongols were great conquerors they were unstoppable so during the time when a mongol emperor was ru- ru- ruling china the mongols captured lots of lands today the chinese claim that the yuan dynasty was a chinese di- dynasty and all these conquests legitimize our territorial claims on other nations even though this is a dynasty that had itself conquered china by which logic mongolia should own china actually today yeah. so that is the convoluted logic that the chinese used then you had the the various other uh, dynasties and then in the 
in the early 19th century you had a civil war in china there was a japanese occupation of manchuria manchukuo they actually to, did much worse the japanese one the one blot on the history of japan is their treatment of the chinese civilians in the run up to second world war horrible horrible that is a stain they cannot uh, they can do nothing about especially what they did in nanjing that's a different story i'll not talk about it because it's too ghastly uh so yes in the 90 in the tw early 20th century the uh, last chinese dynasty fell the then there was a civil war between the kuomintang and the and the communists eventually the communists took over the kuomintang kuomintang had to escape to taiwan island where they still essentially rule so taiwan is regarded by the chinese as a renegade runaway province and mao zedong was able to prevail in the chinese civil war after a horrible civil war lots of bloodshed they took over china so that now we are coming into the modern history right then india became independent it was a transfer of power from one set of crooks to another set of crooks so the set of crooks who were ruling india mr the great shri uh, mr uh, nehru ji and so on yeah so mr nehru becomes prime minister of india india has always had an expanded sphere of cultural and civilizational influence indonesia was always culturally indian until very recently Thailand Burma they were called Swarnabhumi during the times of the Mauryans even Ashoka's time it was called Swarnabhumi today the major airport in Bangkok is called Swarnabhumi airport right you go there there is a big tableau of samudra bandan if you go there right so they still value their indian heritage and culture indonesia is a muslim nation they still value their indian heritage they still have strange names like mohammad vishnu and all that but they still try, try to keep it alive <laughs> Muhammad Vishnu I mean what the hell is that <laughs> So they try to uh, they try to keep it alive there is still a lot of indian influence in Vietnam Cambodia Laos all those places Yes uh, there was this great empire called the Champa empire which lasted 1900 years in Cambodia and Vietnam what is now called the south china sea has always been called the the champa sea always that is the correct name the champa sea the champas were it was an empire it was a great thalassocratic means maritime empire and they were shaivites this was a shaivite empire palavas and uh, cholas yes they were for a time vassals of the cholas because the okay. cholas conquered all of southeast asia up to the philippines right uh, angkor wat in cambodia angkor wat is in is in cambodia cambodia, cambodia. Yeah. so all of this is uh, is tangible evidence of the great hindu past of the great indian past of all this region similarly mongolia was very much indic through tibet and then you had tibet tibet was for the longest time part of india's ex ex extended sphere of influence tibet is part of the indo sphere their culture is 100% indian it obviously has a very distinctive local flavor you go to ladakh there is indian culture but it is ladakhi indian culture you go to kerala you will see kerala K kerala's indian culture similarly you go to tibet you will see very very beautiful distinctive tibetan flavored indian culture which is vajrayana buddhism of the tibetan variety so tibet should always have been under india's protection after 1947 the great magnificent magnanimous mr nehru comes to power and what he does he knows what's what's happening sardar patel had written about this the chinese are they have their eyes on on tibet on ladakh and other places mr nehru disregarded that sir can you show tibet how huge it is like we never used to share borders with them so so tibet is tibet is this enormous plateau north of the himalayas in ancient times this region was called uttar kuru tibet and so called xinjiang which is temporarily part of china right now it is it was historically called uttar kuru even in 19th century maps by german cartographers it is called uttar kuru this tibet xinjiang region and the kazakhstan tajikistan uzbekistan region was always called uttara madra so we had a kuru mahajanapada in india which was south of the himalayas you go straight north in a straight line you get you go to uttarakuru that was called uttarakuru and we had a madra mahajanapada also whose dis whose descendants went into exile into central asia they established indian kingdoms there so that part of central asia was called uttara madra so tibet is this huge region uh it is mostly empty and mao zedong decided to invade tibet in i think 1950 yeah early 1950s he invaded 
and the Chinese were doing very badly in the invasion of Tibet. Such a vast territory, the supply lines, logistical lines were overstretched. The Chinese were starving, they did not have food. So what happens? Mr. Nehru supplies them with rice. During the war? During the invasion of Tibet. Okay, the attempted the invasion. Chinese invasion of Tibet, Mr. Nehru sent rice to the Chinese soldiers. That is why they were able to conquer Tibet. You can look it up. I'm not inventing this story. It's Hindi all Chini bye bye. So the invasion of Tibet would have failed had it not been for the generosity of Mr. Nehru. Now the Chinese take over Tibet. As soon as they take over Tibet, they start constructing roads through Aksai Chin. Right? To thank Mr. Nehru for his generosity. And Mr. Nehru is told about this. He says, what is the problem? Not a blade of grass grows in this region. So he gives away Aksai Chin to, Tibet, to, to the Chinese. Then we know the 1962 war happened, which we lost Mr. Mr. because Mr. Nehru refused the Indian Air Force permission to participate in the war. If and the Indian Air Force was flying, the Chinese would not have been able to win so easily. Is there any justifiable reason for that? I have uh, spent a lot of time thinking about it. I have found no justifiable reason. Okay. What explains this? I have no idea. Uh, yeah, Mr. And, uh, our soldiers were in canvas shoes that we wear to schools, right? Yeah. Our soldiers did not have the right equipment. They were freezing. They had those 303 rifles, Second wo First World War rifles. Okay. The Chinese had machine guns and still we fought them and our, so many of our soldiers so even, died. Even uh, after all this, we could have still won if we used our Air Force. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Then, so we lost 1962, which is something that uh, is, it's a debt that we owe the Chinese. We have to pay them back. We lost 1962. They took some territories, Aksai Chin and so on. In 1967, the Chinese again tried to invade parts of India. There was a war in 1967 and India won the war, but your teachers will not teach you that. Oh, yeah, the media will not speak about this. India defeated China in 1967 in the war. The media doesn't speak about it. Your history textbooks will not write about it. In 1987 to 89, there were more clashes in Arunachal Pradesh, in the Sundarong Chu region. India defeated China there again. But again, the media will not speak about this. They want everyone to think India has always lost to China. That is not the case. Now, let's talk about China a little bit more. The Chinese have this uh, risk, aggressive mindset. Yeah. Risk covers. Yeah, they have this aggressive mindset. They want to bully the ones who are weak. You know, what is the characteristic of a bully? A bully is a coward. A bully will pick on those who are weaker than him. The moment you punch him back in the face, they will run. That's the characteristic of a bully. So just That's what China, China does. Just yes? a second, sir. I just want to, uh, if anyone has any questions, so please raise your hands. Uh, our volunteers will come to you with a piece of paper and pen. That Those questions will be screened and then given up to me uh, during the Q&A. So, yeah, please. So, please continue. Okay. So, uh, Yes, the Chinese have an expansionist mindset. They have used the fake history of the Yuan dynasty, which was a non-Chinese dynasty, to make claims on other nations' territories. The last time they tried to fight somebody was in 1979, when the Chinese tried to invade Vietnam. There was a war between China and Vietnam. Vietnam is over here, and they have a significant border with China. The Chinese tried to fight Vietnam. And they lost the war very badly to a small nation like Vietnam. That is the last time the Chinese were involved in a military conflict. The last conflict, 1979, loss to China. Since then, the Chinese have not fought any single war. In the 1960s, the Chinese fought the Russians. The Chinese have a major border with Russia in Manchuria. And uh, somewhere over here, there is an island, the, the Zhenbao Island, on which the Chinese and the Russians had a major clash. I think it is this one, maybe, right? The Chinese and the Russians had major clashes, just like the clashes you see along the India-Tibet border in Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh. The same kind of hand-to-hand -hand fighting and all that. But this escalated, it went into artil artillery, tank warfare. Hundreds of soldiers died on both sides. And the Russians decided to nuke China. The Russians, under Nikita Khrushchev, was it? Or whoever it was, they decided to nuke China. The Americans find out, found out. And they threatened the Russians that if you nuke China, we're going to nuke you. So the Americans saved China. They saved China's skin. And that led to the eventual America-China rapprochement in the 1970s during the time of Nixon and Mao. Right? So the Americans brought China on their side. And eventually the Russians and the Chinese, they settled the border dispute. But Russia does not trust China as, because they are sensible. Nobody can trust China. 
so russia and china are natural enemies because of their common long shared border and because the russians know that the chinese will reopen this border dispute when they think when they think it is the right time so that is a short history of china and then sure. the chinese liberalized and they were able to become a major industrial and manufacturing power and that's where we are today so um uh, one of your uh, videos um, you said that india brought civilization to china so maybe some light on that yeah like i said that uh, for 2000 years we sent lots of uh, teachers lots of gurus uh, lots of uh, uh, experts in 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 dharma and dhamma buddhist uh, buddhist uh, scriptures vedic scriptures all of that many of these scholars who went to china were experts in buddhism as well as vedic scriptures and all that and the whole of china if you look at all of their architecture ancient architecture if you see all of their ancient temples you will see lots of indian gods buddhist gods all of that so china for 2000 years has been very deeply influenced by indian culture kung fu itself it has come from india today they call it uh, chinese kung fu but it's, uh, it's uh, it originates in india and the interesting is, thing is that all of asia's martial arts they originated in kung fu for instance in in japan in the in the island of okinawa there is this japanese island of okinawa okinawa over here uh, where is it little up here yeah. somewhere here it's a major one of the major japanese islands it is home to shorin ryu karate Shorin Ryu Karate means Shaolin style Karate. So that also the style originates in the Shaolin school and various other uh, martial arts like, uh, for instance, uh, what is it called? Taekwondo, etc. Also have influences from China. Now, Korea. Kalyari Patu is. I have no idea if there is. Some people say that. Some people say. What's, what's the evidence? Okay. Show me the evidence. Bodhi Dharma maybe had. Uh, that is also conjecture. We don't know. Okay. No. I mean, if there is evidence, I'll be happy to accept it. All right. Right. So uh, some people say Kalari Payotu and, uh, and Kung Fu have some relationship. I have seen nothing. Like mother of Kung Fu is Kalari. How do we know it? Show me one piece of evidence. No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so people say that people like to try and uh, create uh, these relationships. But uh, thus far, we have found no evidence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it is some martial art that has gone extinct in India. India was the home to many martial arts. They have all been wiped out by the invaders in the past 1000 years. So maybe the ma original martial art has gone extinct. Very possible, yeah. So now even through China, what we have is that South Korea, I mean the whole of Korea became Indianized. Korea was a Buddhist kingdom, a Buddhist, uh, the, the religion was Buddhism. That only happened through China. Then Buddhism went through China into Japan. In Japan, we have something called Zen Buddhism. The Chinese called it Chan. The original word is Dhyan. Dhyan became Chan in China and became Zen in Japan. So Zen Buddhism is Dhyana Buddhism. It's Dhyana. But and if you, if you say Hindu, Hinduism, there is called Buddhism. But, uh, yeah. So let me talk about that. Yeah, briefly. So if you if you see the various uh, Buddhist temples in Japan, hmm, you will see all kinds of divinities, gods and goddesses, big figures, big uh, statues, murtis of various gods and goddesses with Japanese names. One of the goddesses is called Benzaiten. Benzaiten, she holds a string instrument and she sits on a lotus in a swan. Benzaiten is the Japanese Saraswati. There is also a Japanese Shiva, there is also a Japanese Mahakal, there is also a Ma Japanese Lakshmi, Lakshmi and so on. Ganesh. Every single Hindu god or goddess is present in Japan with Japanese names. There is Vayu, there is Ganp Ganpati, Ganesh, who is called uh, I forget the Japanese name. So if Japan was Buddhist, then how come they are worshipping all these Hindu gods and goddesses? Right? Which means it was not simply Buddhism that was transmitted, it was the whole of Dharma that was transmitted to the East from India. So that is in brief about this. Okay. So very brief history of China and uh, Indian influence on it. So we move on to our favorite nation. Uh, <laughs> So you have a very special name for it. I would. It wouldn't sound nice if I say it. So. So first of all, Pakistan is an artificial nation, and more importantly, Pakistan is a temporary nation. Temporary. Yeah, that's what it is. You have given a newer name. Uh, yeah. You have given a newer name recently, uh, which is Pakistan occupied Punjab. All of those territories are temporarily occupied by Pakistan. Sindh is temporarily occupied by Pakistan. Punjab. See, understand the history of Punjab. What is Pakistan Punjab today? Has 
just a hundred or so years ago, 150 years ago, it was part of the Sikh empire of Maharaja Ranjit Singh Ji. Now, how does that become part of Pakistan? The British broke the Sikh empire and they gave Ranjit Singh's empire most of it to the Pakistanis. This is completely illegal. This is completely wrong. Pakistan itself should never have been created. Why did we agree to the creation of Pakistan? We, we in this room have not agreed to it. It is certain people who claim to be our leaders who agreed to this. And who benefited from this is the question. Father of our nation. The father of our nation. Yes, sir. He, he actually uh, tried not to, right? Agree to it. You know, there is a difference between words and actions. Indians love words. We love words. We are so impressed by words. Today, yesterday, Mr. Sharif, whichever Sharif is in power right now, Fe Shabash, Shabash Sharif. So, Mr. Shabash Sharif goes and says that we want peace with India and all Indians are celebrating. Are bhai, shabd hai ye. Ye karya nahi hai. These are not actions. Never focus on words, only focus on actions. Indians have been misled by fake leaders to focus on words. So if you come to Indians and say nice, nice words, we will start, stop, start worshipping that person, even if the person's actions are all anti-India. But the words are very nice. So, so look at Mr. Gandhi. Mr. Gandhi said that I will not allow partition. Partition will happen over my dead body. Hmm? So did he put his dead body somewhere to stop partition? What action did it take to stop partition? Nothing. He took no action to stop partition. Only words, words, words. Words don't do anything, bhai. This is something Indians have to realize. Words versus actions. If you want to understand the true nature of any leader, completely ignore their words and only see their actions. Then you will see a whole different picture. Whether it is Mr. Modi or, or it, it is anybody else from history, only see the actions. One of the greatest things about Shri Chinggis Khan is that he did not write a diary. He left behind no words. Only his actions are visible. So we understand him if we, if we know how to look at history. But there are people like Mr. Gandhi who wrote thousands and thousands of words. And today there is a whole scholarship genre, which is Gandhian studies. They are all examining his words and trying to find various meanings, which is a complete waste of time. Just look at his actions. What did he do for India? I have said this on occasion that Mr. Gandhi was a British agent. And if it offends somebody, I would like to apologize to absolutely nobody. Yeah? <laughs> so, Mr. Gandhi, if you only focus on his actions, it only benefited the British. So, we're going to talk about Pakistan. Pakistan is an yeah. integral part of this. So, we all study the history of Pakistan, how it came to be and all that. But I'm going to tell you a whole different story. A completely different story that nobody has taught you. So, understand this. We spoke about Russia, the history of Russia. We spoke about, I spoke about the fact that the Russians... Uh, lost the Crimean War in the 1850s to the, to the British. Yes, there was a struggle. It was called the Great Game in Central Asia for the, uh, for the ownership and control of the Central Asian region. And the big prize was India. The British held India, but India was thousands of kilometers away from Britain. The Russians were in control of large parts of Central Asia. If they could come to India, they could take away Britain's crown jewel and, and colonize India themselves. So the key to controlling India was the control of Central Asia. And that was the great game. It, it, this entire struggle lasted more than a century. The struggle for the control of Central Asia between the British Empire and the Russian Empire. That is something no Indians are taught in history. Okay, So this is the context in which we have to understand what happened. A lot of what happened in Aksai Chin, Tibet also is part of the great game. And the great game is still continuing in a sense. Now understand why Pakistan was created. When the British understood that they are no longer in a position. See, why did the British leave India? The British had to hastily leave India because of something that happened in 1946. The great Indian naval rebellion. The Indian Navy suddenly, all of a sudden, spontaneously rebelled against the British crown. All Just overnight, the entire British Indian uh, Navy from Aden to Singapore was out of control. And they had all rebelled and they were all demanding independence. right? And they had put up three flags on their ships. They were all coordinating through wireless. So they were all in com uh, communication with each other more than, I don't know how many ships, the entire Indian Navy. And they had put up three flags on each ship. One was the Indian National Congress flag, 
Mr. Gandhi's flag, one was the uh, Muslim League flag and one was the Communist flag. These were the three main political parties in India at the time, which were supposedly fighting for India's independence. So they put up three flags. Then uh, there was police firing in Mumbai, in Bombay. Thousands of people died. Your historians, your teachers will not teach you this. Thousands of people. The, you see, the people of Bombay came out of the streets supporting the Indian Naval Rebellion. The British had them shot. Thousands of people died on the streets of Bombay in 1946. None of your history teachers will teach you this, or your textbooks will not teach you this. There was similar firing in Vishakhapatnam, there was similar firing in Karachi. How many Indians died, we don't even know. So, then what happens is that Mr. Gandhi says that this kind of rebellion is unacceptable. Okay? And he sends Mr. Patel to Bombay. It was then called Bombay. Now it's Mumbai. Then it was called Bombay. So, Mr. Gandhi sent Mr. Patel, Mr. Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel to Bombay to negotiate with the rebels. So Mr. Patel comes to Bombay, he enters into negotiations, he says you need to stop this immediately and we guarantee you that there will be no repercussions, no action will be taken against you if you put down your weapons now. So these people, they got dejected and they, within a week the entire rebellion was shut down, immediately they were all, arrest, uh, all arrested and court-martialed. So Mr. Patel, whatever promise he gave was a lie. Actions versus words, right? So now understand, we'll go further from this, yeah? So because of this, the, and if the Indian army had come to know what happened, and if the Indian army on Indian soil had also participated in the rebellion, within 24 hours India was free. Because there is no way the British were able to control India without the Indian army. The British control over India was not because of Ahinsa. It was because of the might of the British Indian army. The moment the Indian army turns, turns their back from the British, it was over. So when the British realized they can no longer trust the armed forces of India, that's when they had to hastily withdraw from India within one year in 1947 itself. Now, when they were withdrawing from India, there was the possibility that uh, the Russians were already in control. The USSR was up to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, all the way to the neighborhood of Afghanistan, which is the Indian subcontinent. When the British left, if they left behind a unified subcontinent, and if India gave access to Russia to the Indian Ocean, it was game over for the West. Then India will become on the, on the, on the side of the USSR and there will be a huge coalition and a very powerful coalition with, and it will give Russia for the first time in its history access to the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. So they wanted to anyhow prevent this from happening. A unified India would not listen to Britain. So the British created a fake artificial nation divided on the lines of religion, a small nation that will always feel threatened by India if you teach them right, right things, and they will always be pro-West, pro-British, and that's why they, this country, this fake artificial nation, temporary nation was created. And if you look at Pakistan's history, it's always been pro-UK, pro-West, and the UK has always been pro-Pakistan, even today it is pro-Pakistan, even today the US is pro-Pakistan. This is the geopolitical reason why Pakistan was created. All this, what we are taught, this freedom struggle and the do call me nazariya, two nation, three theory, this is all, you know, it's all cosmetic paint that has been applied to the real reasons why Pakistan was created. So that's what it is. So today Pakistan, we know, it's a failed state. It is a state that is, I mean, it's a state in decay. There is uh, no law and order. There is no justice. There is nothing there. In every nation, the nation has an army. In Pakistan, the army has a nation. The army runs the country. And the army is a mercenary army. They serve somebody else. They serve a higher power. Between 2005 to 2019, 20, 21, they were serving China. The Pakistanis were serving China. Before that, they were serving the US. The Americans were financing and funding Pakistani terrorism in India. The Americans financed and funded the genocide of the Kashmiris in the 1990s. All Ta of that was done by the Americans. Taliban also. Taliban, yeah, Taliban also to a, to a certain extent. So Pakistan has always been an instrument of the West to destabilize India and to further certain geopolitical uh, agendas. For instance, in the 1980s, when the USSR, in the 1970s, late 70s, when the USSR invaded Afghanistan, they, they could have easily reached the Indian Ocean if it was not for Pakistan. The Pakistanis stopped the, the Russians from going further. So it has served the geopolitical purpose it was created to serve. It has nothing to do with the Indian uh, cultural divide and the Hindu-Muslim divide. All of that is just an excuse 
for, to to create these fake artificial nations to further the western geopolitical agenda so pakistan is always on the brink of disaster it is a failed state but it is not allowed to fail because it is important to the west right now just a week ago they have announced a 10 billion dollar uh, loan or whatever you know a package for pakistan the Saudis are giving a billion dollars, the Americans are giving a whole lot of money, EU is giving money, France is giving money, the UK is giving money, and so on and so forth. Even the Chinese are giving some money. So everybody, all these nations want India to remain off balance by using Pakistan against India. That's the deal with Pakistan. So um, as a youngster who has always seen Pakistan as a unified map, like their map, um, their state, I think, has uh, Pashtunistan, uh, POJK, uh, then there is Baloch, and then Sindh. Were they all by legally uh, the right to accession? <laughs> were, were were they um, like conquered like that or? Yeah. See, listen. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you make a country. It's usually done by force. But if you look at the te technicalities, uh, Jammu and Kashmir obviously acceded to India. Uh, and because Mr. Nehru allowed the Pakistanis to take over one third of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, that's why we have POK and uh, POJK, right? Uh, when it comes to Balochistan, the Balochistan, Balochistan had, had opted for freedom. Okay. They had opted for freedom and they were invaded by Muhammad Ali Jinnah's army on Jinnah's behest. And Balochistan is under illegal Pakistani occupation. Balochistan actually is a large region. Half of it is in Iran, half of it is in Pakistan. All of that should be free. So if India starts supporting free Balochistan, it's going to create issues with Iran also. You know, okay. that's a story. When it comes to Sindh, there is a Sindh free freedom struggle. GA Sindh movement. There were demonstrations last week in Sindh. There is a, yesterday also perhaps, yeah. So Sindh has always had this sentiment that they want to be free from Pakistan. Punjab used to be Maharaja Ranjit Singh's territory. It, it never belonged to uh, an Islamic nation like Pakistan. So all of it has been illegitimately... And Pashtunistan. To Pashtunistan, uh -huh. Pashtunistan is a very interesting story. So Maharaja Ranjit Singh, see, before Ranjit Singh ji came to power, uh, the Abdalis of Afghanistan had taken over Kashmir and this uh, large parts of northern India. Not large, but reasonable parts of northern India. And they had committed all kinds of horrific atrocities against the Indians. The Hindus, the Afghans, Pashtuns themselves are of Indian origin. They are of Rajput origin, okay? Uh, Kandahar used to be called the city of Rajputs before it became Islamized. Uh, so the Abdalis and the Afghans had committed all kinds of horrific atrocities against Hindus in northern India. Then the Sikh Empire rose up, the great Maharaj Ranjit Singh liberated this region and he re-established dharma in this region. He outlawed cow slaughter and much more. Then as a punitive measure, he took over more Pashtun territory. He expanded northward and westward and, and captured Pashtun territory also which in, on which he imposed his rule. That was the boundary of the uh, India and Afghanistan boundary, the, the boundary between Afghanistan and the Sikh Empire. When the Sikh Empire fell to the British, the British made that the boundary between Afghanistan and India, British India. After independence, that is called the Durand Line. After independence, that became the boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And the Afghans, the Pashtuns have always regarded that part which Maharaj Ranjit Singh took as part of the territory because it is, it is a Pashtun major, majority region. It's called Pashtunistan. So Pakistan and Afghanistan have an open and serious border dispute and they are not going to have peace. And the Taliban are Pashtun nationalists. They are not pro-Pakistan. They are very deeply anti-Pakistan. This is going to be an issue that will go on. And, um, as we also know, Jinnah's family did not follow him, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the, the greatest failure of Muhammad Ali Jinnah is that none of his descendants who are alive today, he has many, none of them is a Pakistani. His daughter, she, she, was, she chose to be kind to her father and not become Indian. So she took up Canadian citizenship, but she spent a large part of her life in India itself. And her son, Nusli, Nusli Wadia, is Indian. His, uh, her grandson, Nes Wadia, is Indian and so on. So th their entire family is mostly Indian. So Jinnah's greatest failure is that his family did not choose to be Pakistani. Yeah, so that's where we know temporary nation. Sir, how did they get nuclear power? Did, did uh, West help them or they, as they say, they developed it? The Americans knew that India had the scientists and the, uh, the brains to 
to make uh, to have a proper nuclear weapons program. India's first nuclear test was in 1974. Yeah, but we yeah. were caught. So then the um, West decided that Pakistan needs to balance India in this matter also. So they allowed that guy E.Q. Abdul Qadir Khan to to steal some blueprints from from the Netherlands or somewhere of nuclear reactors, centrifuges per perhaps you know nuclear centrifuges. Um, you have to purify uranium 238 into uranium 235. If you have 90 percent uranium 235, that is weapons grade uranium. Yeah, there are three I three natural isotopes of uranium. So uh, the centrifuge is the machine that does the purification. So I think the blueprints for the centrifuges were stolen by Abdul Qadir Khan from the West, but it was done with the West's permission. And the, the Chinese also got involved in this and they sent a North Korean nuclear bomb design to Pakistan and possibly that, that design was tested in Tibet by the Chinese on behalf of Pakistan. So the Chinese, uh, so the Pakistanis essentially have a weapon that is using uranium that is purified using Western techniques and the design of the weapon itself is North Korean and tested by the Chinese. So that's what it is. All these nations want India to fail. India actually has no real friends and that's good. We are 1.4 billion, why do we need anybody? So we now move on to geopolitics. Um, so this is the history that we have known. Um, now, what are the repercussions? So, let's start with Russia. As just as just the last line you said, it's so significant in what I'm what I'm going to say now. Russia, we are brothers, right? I mean, uh, they have always helped us. Um, even in the movie Rocketry, they gave us cryogenic engines. They always gave us weapons. They always give us technology. So, what's the truth? Is the, are they real brothers or? Nice way to instigate me, <laughs> Look, we Indians love certain countries, no? We love Russia, we Israel. love Israel. Israel, yeah. Hmm? You go to the Israeli Ministry of External Affairs and you see the map of their embassies in the world and see the map of India. See for yourself. See what kind of map of India they're showing, yeah? So, you know, Israel is no, no great fan of India. We think Israel is our iron brother, we have the same, all that. Israeli culture is Abrahamic culture. It's extraordinarily different from Indian culture. They hate idol worshippers. They hate polytheists. They regard polytheists uh, goyim, which is the, the Israeli Hebrew word for kafir. Yeah? Okay. And uh, yeah, so I have spoken about Israel. It's created a lot of controversy. I'll stop there with Israel. Uh, let's talk about Russia. Look, the Russians, they started uh, an annual set of exercises with Pakistan in 2016 and 2017. It was called Druzhba. Druzhba means friendship in Russian. Russian. Druzhba. Druzhba 2016, 70, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. But there was no Druzhba 2022 between Russia and Pakistan. So one year the military exercises are held in Pakistan, one year in Russia. It is not the act of a friendly nation to hold military exercises with our number one enemy. So if Indians think that Russia is our best friend, you have to once again, you know, look at the actual facts. Now, in 2022, for some reason, the exercise did not happen. Because in 2022, they really needed India. Yeah. So Russia, see, every nation looks out for its own national interest. Every nation prioritizes its national interest over everything else. These are the principles of Vishnugupta Chanakya, and we have to understand that. We are from the land of Vishnugupta Chanakya, but we are so delusional. And we are so naive. We think Russia is our best friend. There are no friends in geopolitics. There are temporary enemies and there are temporary allies. But everything is temporary. Please read the Arthashastra. Read what our great Guru Shri Vishnu Gupta Chanakya told us. The most naive population I see in the world today is Indians. That too coming from the land of Vishnu Gupta Chanakya. Israel is not our friend. Israel is cooperating with India because it suits them. They gained... They, they, they stand to gain money from it. They, they were trying to first woo China in the 2000s and 2010s. The Americans stopped them from doing it because the Americans own Israel. So the Americans prohibited the Israelis from selling sensitive technology to China. Otherwise, they would have done it. They already sold the blueprint for the Chinese J, JF-17 Thunder, the fighter plane, to China. It was an Israeli design that they sold to the Chinese, right? The Israelis wanted to sell much more to China, but the Americans stopped them. So now they have turned to India. Obviously, we have certain uh, 
shared interests, our national interests align to a significant extent. So we are working together and obviously it's for mutual benefit. There is no friendship in this. It suits us, it also suits them. That's why we are working together. We are developing missiles together, we are working in cybersecurity together and other things as well. Similarly with Russia, for some time Russia was looking to Pakistan. For some time, Russia is also cooperating with China right now. But Russia is also scared of China. So that's why they need India to counterbalance China. So geopolitics is a very complicated and complex affair. There are no real friends, there are no permanent enemies. Permanent enemies are those whom, with whom you share a common border. Those are permanent enemies. And that's why when it comes to China, the solution, the long-term solution to the India-China issue is for India to somehow find a way to free Tibet. If we free Tibet, there will be no more a boundary between India and China. And then relations can go back to the normal of the past 2000 years. As long as the Chinese occupy Tibet, we are going to be enemies and permanent enemies. Right now, India is not in a position to free Tibet. Eventually, we will be in the position. And that's why the Chinese don't want India to progress. And the West also doesn't want India to progress. So what should we do? Like we have to first get CCP out, but before that we need to increase our GDP. So if we want to get rid of the CCP, if we want to engineer some kind of regime change in China, uh, first of all, we have to become strong ourselves. Right now we are a small economy. I mean, we are not, a, you know, we are a great power now. The events of 2022, made India a great power. We have been able to uh, neutralize the Chinese Communist Party to a certain extent. We have been able to prevent Russia from becoming a Chinese slave because we started buying enormous amounts of Russian oil, which is why Russia has been able to secure itself and uh, other reasons as well. So India is now one of the great powers. Indi it is, India is no longer a middle power. India is not by any means a superpower, but India is one of the three great powers. India, Russia and China are great powers. The US is a superpower. But we, sh we should not be content with where we are. We have not reached even 2% of our potential. We have to first find a way to as soon as possible, as rapidly as possible, reach the 5 trillion annual GDP mark, then the 10 trillion mark. Once we are at 10, tr 10 trillion, our military strength will grow proportionately. And once you are at the 10 trillion mark, it's kind of hard for anybody to try and mess with you. So that's what needs to happen first. Then we can look at other things. Of course, everything has to happen simultaneously in parallel, but the main focus has to be the Indian economy. So uh, coming to China now, how has COVID uh, like helped them or dis destroyed them? <laughs> yes, COVID has been, uh, you know, even I used to, I used to call this virus the Wuhan virus, right? It originated in Wuhan, but at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, whom did it help and whom did it harm? It has destroyed the Chinese economy. It has destroyed the Chinese manufacturing. The Chinese manufacturing has stopped, more or less stopped. The exports have crawled to almost a halt. The GDP is contracted. The Chinese GDP is now showing negative growth. They are trying to say it's 1%, 2%, 3%. It's actually negative. They have always been lying about their GDP numbers for the past 10 years but the GDP is now contracting. There are these horrific lockdowns in China and they, they, there's nothing they can do about it. The prime reason is that their vaccine is absolutely useless. We think China is this high tech superpower. They were not able to produce a vaccine that works. Its efficacy is less than 10%. If you look at all the vaccines, COVID vaccines, the Indian vaccine has been the best thus far. And the figures bear this out. Our scientists have developed the best vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is not as good as the Indian vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine kills more people than it saves. <laughs> and the Chinese vaccine is like a water, water shot, nothing happens. And that's why the Chinese are in a deep, deep, deep mess. This pandemic, the two and the past two and a half years have ruined China. China was on track to become a superpower in the next 10, 20 years, by 2050. They had this big belt and road initiative, this big infrastructure development uh, program, trillions of dollars they were spending in it across Eurasia. They had the maritime Silk Route, which was going to create this, uh, this big network of ports that will help China connect it to Africa and all that. Everything has stopped. Everything has stopped. All the construction of infrastructure has stopped. And now nobody trusts China. Nobody wants to work with China. Only poor nations with dictators will work with China, nobody else. So COVID has destroyed China's aspirations to become a superpower. And now they are no longer on track to... See, earlier they were supposed to 
surpass the US by 2040 or 2050. By today's growth rate, China will not catch up with the US by 2067, if at all ever. But India could become a $30 trillion economy by 2050, 2060. So now India is the big threat for the West. The West has been ruling the world according to its whims and fancies. They control the global financial system. If India wants to earn, let's say, a trillion, a trillion dollars, we have to trade with the world. And we have to earn one trillion US dollars. If the US wants to earn a trillion dollars, they have to print the money. Yeah. They control the printing press. So the Americans have been using this free money to subjugate the world. Now India is the big major threat. And now the Americans may want to use China to counterbalance India and use Pakistan to counterbalance India. Right now there are negotiations happening between the Americans and the Chinese, quietly, not in the big public eye. So that is what's happening right now. So the Chinese aim, the Chinese ambition to become a superpower has been derailed. The Russians have been saved by India because India started importing enormous quantities of Russian oil. So the Russians did not have to go begging to China after the Ukraine war when all the sanctions were hit upon them. So the Russians have been saved by India. Now India and Russia have to work together to counterbalance China. And then let's see how it goes. It's a very complicated situation, but that's where we are. Yeah, lots of countries are trying to sign up to BRICS now. So. Yeah, BRICS is interesting. Many countries want to be part of BRICS, but as long as India and China are, are, are enemies, BRICS is not a stable organization. So there is no more a threat um, that you used to speak before the war mm. that they might, you know, start a small war to Haan. destabilize the government, but now it's not beneficial. Oh, no, it no, seems no. like that. Uh, you know what? Uh, the, the interesting thing about China and the US is that when it comes to India, they have the same feelings. Okay. The Americans would like to see the Modi government fail in the 2024 elections. They would like to see a weak government come to power so that they can. Uh, you know, manipulate India. The Chinese also want to see the Modi government fail in the 2024 elections. They would also like to see some coalition government or some weak leader come to power. So, one of the ways of achieving this is by inflicting a hypothetical military defeat on India. And the Americans will not start a war with India, so they, they would like the Chinese to start a war with India. Some small, short, sharp war, maybe along the Siliguri region. If the Siliguri region is a very short corridor, right? So if the Chinese are able to take that over, then they can cut off Northeast India. That would be perceived by the population as a humiliation and a failure of Narendra Modi. And then 2024 could go the wrong way. So t this is a very important year for India. It's a very political year. And it is likely, it is a possibility that the Chinese may try some stupid misadventure and try to start some short, sharp war with India. That still exists. The threat still exists. Especially when China is not doing well, they will want to divert the attention of their population to something external. Similar to what Tawang happened. Could be something like that, yeah. Okay. So the so last question on geopolitics from my, uh, my side. Um, you say Pakistan is a temporary nation, but they are a nuclear power. How long do you think we, ha uh, we will take to make them permanently temporary? Right. So Pakistan has always been propped up by the West. Right now, last week, they have given a $10 billion uh, begging bowl package to Pakistan. So the West does not want China to fail. They want China to, uh, sorry, Pakistan. I, I mean Pakistan. The West does not want Pakistan to disintegrate. They want to keep it there in order to counterbalance India. So right now, the West is more powerful than India in our neighborhood. The West is more powerful than China because the China is still not able to take Taiwan. The US is genuinely a superpower. They are way more powerful than anybody else. So I would say that the next 10 years, India has to build up its economy and military. And once we are at a certain tipping point, maybe in 10 years, then Pakistan could possibly see some something happening there. Maybe 10 years or so. Yeah, I cannot give an exact figure, but maybe 10 years. Maybe 10 years, OK. So now we move on to Q&A. Um, I have um, some five, six questions. We'll try to move quickly through them. Um, first question is, what would have happened if Sardar Patel, Vallabhbhai, Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel was the first PM of India? Right. So Mr. Patel was, uh, see, we have to understand Mr. Patel was a Gandhian. He was a firm follower of Mr. Gandhi. But he was a realistic person. He understood the threat of China. And he did not believe in the socialism of Mr. Nehru. So I believe that India would have gone on a better stronger trajectory under Mr. Patel. Uh, 
the tibet invasion by china would possibly not have happened it may have failed the indian army may could possibly have gotten involved india could have had stronger economic growth not like the nehruvian rate of growth until the 1990s so overall it, it would it would have been so a what better is the nehruvian uh, rate of growth the nehruvian rate of growth was the uh, fabian socialistic policies that nehru implemented in india which so india's economy grow at 1% or 2% or 3% per year for 20 30 40 that's years that's what developed countries do normally yes a nation that is so we uh, that was in the position of india should have grown at 10 20% per year for the first few years you know um the follow up question to that is is akhand bharat possible akhand bharat is a work in progress eventually what is akhand bharat it is the whole indian subcontinent including sri lanka including nepal including afghanistan pakistan balochistan the even the iranian part and uh, does myanmar come in it not really okay we don't need to have all of it inside so akhand bharat doesn't need necessarily need to be a single entity it can be a coalition a, a, a civilizational state instead of a nation state but the problem is the uh, radicalized population in pakistan afghanistan and bangladesh right so akhand bharat is a work in progress maybe in a 100 years maybe our descendants will do it we need to be patient our plans are measured in centuries we are not a temporary small nation state we are a 10000 plus year old civilization a century is nothing for us so we are a link in the chain and we have to do our job and we have to educate the future generations so that they will do the right things but i think within a 100 years we could have it सो इट्स वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर अस जो हमें अपने संस्कार देने हैं नेक्स्ट जनरेशन को नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज कैन वी री राइट आर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन द होली बुक आई एम श्योर वी कैन यू नो वी नीड टू हैव अ स्ट्रॉन्ग इनफ लीडर आई एम नॉट सेंग द करंट लीडर इज नॉट स्ट्रॉन्ग बट द स्ट्रेंगनिंग ऑफ द प्रोसेस नीड्स टू बी बेटर वी डेफिनेटली नीड एन a new constitution a dharmic constitution a constitutional a constitution must embody the civilizational values of the culture it is supposed to be about it has to embody our cultural values and our constitution is not doing that it is an abrahamic constitution it is a western copy constitution it is a copy pasted constitution understand this when the americans came up with a constitution their founding fathers wrote the constitution the uh, the framers of the constitution and then the constitution was put to a vote there was a referendum the people of the us the rich white men they were given the choice of accepting or rejecting the constitution in the case of india the constitution was never ratified by the people of india it says we the people but we the people have never voted for it whether we accept or reject it and the people who framed the constitution did not represent the wills and the aspirations and the hopes of the people of india because they were chosen from 13% of the voting population of india and that election was held under foreign occupation so the entire constitution of india is illegitimate it has never been ratified it does not represent our culture so we need a new constitution and when a strong enough leader comes to power this will happen so uh, the next question is who introduced islam i am assuming in india so it was the turks was it turks so so uh, there were these waves of turkic uh, the first uh, invasion that had an islamic element was the invasion arabic invasion of mohammed bin qasim in the 8th century or so it was from the west in it came through persia the arabs had conquered persia and destroyed persia and then they tried to invade sindh it was moderately successful but overall a failure so that was the first attempt and then for several centuries there were waves of turkic invasions from the northwest through the khyber pass and through afghanistan into india they first took over gandhar and then slowly 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 over many centuries they were able to make inroads into india so it's the turks the turkic tribes that in, uh, that introduced islam into india so there's a small request uh, the kind of question it is can you talk more about 1967 war with china oh uh, the 1967 war of Ch with china was a rather brief war it was not a well spread out war like the 1962 war was um it was a short sharp war and the chinese were were defeated very rapidly and very soundly i myself do not remember there is a whole book about this 
maybe i should uh, delve deeper into it so that's as much I can, as i can tell you right now there's a question you say china could try a misadventure this year at the same time you say china is a coward isn't that a paradox the chinese believe that they are superior to india the chinese believe that they are they, they know that they have three times the economy of india which means that they have much more military firepower and a coward is one who attacks when he thinks he is very strong and who thinks that the uh, the person i am attacking is weak so if china tries to attack india now it is the move of a coward because they think they are strong and we are weak but obviously it is a stupid thing to do because we have certain weapons that they don't want to taste so i i so i what i said is correct that they are bullies and they are cowards but chances are india will win that i think the chinese will get will be defeated very roundly very badly if they try something because what general perception uh, we people have is that india is very weak in front in uh, against china so so the chinese have not been tested in battle since 1979 the last war was in 1979 and they lost the war to a small nation called vietnam secondly their uh, their military positions in tibet are exposed there is no forest cover or anything there everything is visible from sat satellites we have satellites that can see everything that's happening in real time including in bad weather including at night so we know what the chinese are doing we know where their military installations are they are within easy range of our missiles and our bombers our fighter bombers and the terrain is such that it is an, it gives india an advantage because we our soldiers that the indo tibetan border police the, the various um, acclimatized uh, forces etc they understand the region very well the han chinese they come from thousands of kilometers away in tibet and they are not used to the terrain and the climate and the weather and the altitude of tibet and also the supply chain the supply routes of tibet of of, of china are very long and they can be easily cut off by india so because of all these things india has a significant advantage when it comes to fighting china in the himalayas and i believe india will win very easily against china and it could be uh, like a disaster for china if they do this so will they try um, if it comes to their own existence the like ccp's existence will they try a nuclear i don't think india should try to eliminate the ccp's existence india should simply defeat the ccp in tibet they will remove them themselves. and then the people of china will yeah. see that as a defeat as a humiliation the chinese do not tolerate failure the chinese public does not tolerate failure you look at 2000 years of chinese history whenever a dynasty fails in military conflict they are overthrown so if the chinese try something and they fail it's going to be a disaster we don't have to do anything more and there's the same thing with russia right they are okay with cruel leaders but they should be winners they don't tolerate yes kindness but you know yes the russian history is very hard they are okay with hard leaders cruel leaders but they don't tolerate failure leaders must succeed so that's a deal one follow up question from myself how did they rapidly ramp up those industrial outputs in russia so it's it's not something that happened overnight they had a industrial base that goes back to the 19th century all right so they had the industrial base they had the technological know how they had uh, the the uh, the scientists the technicians the engineers who knew how to do this and because of the war there was this enormous war effort war industry ammunition uh, weapons howitzers tanks incredible numbers of fighter planes bombers so all of that machinery is what sustained the war so all of that was then repurposed into civilian industries so the, the in, uh, entire base was already there and they were able to leverage that in a very efficient manner after the second world war was over that, that's how it happened and in uh, between russia and ukraine conflict who should india support india's like official position from a very non political indian citizen youngster you know because we are very used to be yeah so from our perspective not getting into politics it is beneficial for us if russia comes out on top because the entire system is rigged in favor of the west it is impoverishing the rest of the world including india the us is uh, is propping up pakistan it may in the future prop up china against india also the americans funded pakistani terrorism in india for decades the americans are funding ukraine now we have to understand there are reasons for this if the russians fail then the americans will reestablish their complete domination and hegemony over the world russia if you look at the map of russia it it covers the whole of northern eurasia macinder yeah macinder theory that's the heartland it 
the Russian territory contains at least 50% of all the natural resources in the world. If the Americans get a hold of that, they will rule for another 500 years. We need a change in the way the world is run. The, the American Western capitalistic model is destroying the planet. You have mountains of plastic in the oceans because they are using the oceans as a, as a, as, as a trash bin. They have destroyed North America. They have they have genocided the population, 100 million Native Americans dead, forests wiped out, they are now fracking it, and they will eventually do that to the whole world. We need a different kind of world order, maybe eventually one that is led by India through Indian values, and it begins in Ukraine. So Ukraine is an attempt by the East to start a parallel world order, which eventually hopefully becomes a whole world order. And we cannot have the Russians imposing their order on the world, or the Chinese doing that, Eventually, it has to be India, but it has to start with Ukraine. So for that reason, I would say that Russia needs to prevail in Ukraine. It's, it's already prevailing. You know, Indian media blindly copies the West. If you watch Hindi news channels, they are, they, it's like the Ukrainians are reporting there. They are just giving you word by word uh, Hindi translation of what the BBC and CNN and all that is saying. What's happening in reality is very different, but the Russian media has been completely censored from social media and from everything else. So we don't quite know what's happening and we are being made to believe that Russia is losing and they have, they've been lo losing since February last year. Well, they're still here. <laughs> so I have a is not See, what, what makes you think Russia is getting weaker? Yes, and they have resources. They have resources. They have 50% of the world's natural resources. They have as much oil and gas as they will ever need for the next 100, 200 years. They have a population. They have 300,000 reserves that are now being put into the, uh, into the war effort. They are, uh, they are recruiting more reserves and they'll be trained. They also have the weapon systems. They have tens of thousands of missiles. They have everything. The Western media wants us to believe that Russia is failing. It's not failing. By now, it would have failed otherwise. Well, they, they are there, and now there's something else which is going to happen soon. <laughs> so one last question for all the youngsters, which is not related to the topic. Romanis, can you please, because it's something very Indian uh, connection to it. Right, the Romanis are also known as the gypsies. So if you look at, uh, when you think of Spain, Spanish culture, you think of flamenco, flamenco dance, flamenco music. The flamenco music is Romani music. Who are the Romani people? So about a thousand years ago, the Turkic invasions of India began. And there is this mountain range in Afghanistan. It was in Vedic times, in old times, called the Upari Siena mountain range. Siena means falcon. It's, it's a raptor, it's a bird, it's a bird of prey. It looks like an eagle. So the word for, Shien, for falcon in Sanskrit was Siena. So these mountains were called the Upari Siena mountains, which means they were so high that even the falcons could not fly that high. Right? The, and that word in Persian is now called Shaheen. Shiena became Shaheen. Now, these mountains are now called the Hindu Kush mountains. It means the killer of Hindus. The reason is that these Turks, they used to take tens of thousands of Indian slaves out of India into Central Asia through the Hindu Kush. And that mountain range is so called that incredible numbers of Indians, Hindus died there. That's why it's called the Hindu Kush. So incredible numbers of Indian men, women, and children were taken as slaves for various purposes. We know what the purposes are. They were taken into Central Asia. You look at Central Asia, lots of people look like Indians today. You look at the Arabic countries, so many people look like Indians today. Look at Yemen, they all look like Indians. Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein looked like an Indian. His sons look like Indians. You know, why is it so? They all have Indian matrilineal lineages, not patrilineal lineages. Uh, so Indians were taken as slaves in enormous numbers into Central Asia. Eventually what happened is that they realized that they, they took too many Indians there and they did not need so many Indians. And most likely they did not want to slaughter them all on their territory. So what they did is that they set them free and ordered them to go westwards but not back eastwards into India. That's hap that happened about a thousand years ago. And ever since then, these people who are called the Romani, they have been wandering around Europe and they have been subjected to all kinds of horrific atrocities and racism which happens even today. So Romani people in Europe are Indian origin people. Most of them look like us, yes. 
their language is called the Romani language. It is it is classified as an Indo-Aryan language. If you listen to it, you will actually understand some of it. Yeah. So and they also went through Holocaust. They went through the Holocaust. Uh, same way Israelis went, uh, the Jewish people. Went. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, the the uh, the Nazis tried to exterminate the Romanis too, which is strange because the Nazis claim to be Aryans, but the Romanis are the real Aryans, the Indians. Yep. Yeah. Anyhow, they tried to eliminate the, the Romani people. Uh, I would say at least a million Romanis would have been killed in the gas chambers by the Nazis. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the Jews refused to recognize the Romani Holocaust. There is this Nobel Prize winner called Eli Weisel who was a survivor of the Holocaust. He is, a, he is a Jewish person. He was a Jewish person. He's dead now. So there was a Holocaust memorial in the US which was being built. And Eli Weisel refused to allow recognition of the Romani genocide in the Holocaust memorial. Because he was of the opinion that the, the Jewish are special people and the Romanis are not. Their Romanis are inferior. Color of the skin? Color of skin and Indian origin. And sir, personalities. What personalities? Romani personalities which we... Romani. Um, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was Indian origin, Romani. If you know Led Zeppelin, their, their main singer, Robert Plant, he has blonde hair, but he's Romani. Uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Eric Cantona, Ro Ro Robert Balak. Uh, Michael Balak, the German. Uh, Michael, Michael Balak, yes, of course. Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo, most likely, yes. Picasso. Pablo Picasso. Elvis Presley, Yul Brynner. Einstein. Uh, no, Einstein was a Jew. Okay. Einstein was a Jew. There are so many of them who are even today afraid to say that they are Romani because there is this stigma attached to them. There was this guy. See, one of the major Romani families in the UK is the Blythe family. B-L-Y-T-H-E, Blythe. Some of them emigrated to the US. There was this guy in the US whose name was William Blythe. Okay? He is still alive. His mother... So his father was Blythe. He was this, this boy's name was William Blythe. Then his mother married a different guy whose surname was Clinton. So William Blythe became Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, the pre president of the US. He also has Romani blood. There are so many of them in, in Europe. Most of them we don't even know. Lots of footballers in the, in, in the European leagues. Many of them are of Romani origin. Many musicians and artists and actors and singers are of Romani origin. Many politicians, at least one pres former president of Brazil was of Romani origin and so much more. They have contributed so much to European culture, uh, especially music. Flamenco music is Romani music. It's not Spanish music. Now it's called Spanish music. So yeah, that's the story of the Romanis. So basically, whoever you think they look slightly Indian, doubt it. Possibility that they may be, they so may have Romani. Doubt them, yeah. Okay, so here we end. That was our interaction with Abhijit sir. In this, we have a lot of fun. We have learned a lot, understood and got a lot of value. I hope that you will have the same experience for you. We will bring a new video every month with a big amazing speaker. So, please like, share and subscribe to this channel. And we will see you in the next video.